Are you struggling with diseases in the landscape? Maybe you have some powdery mildew on your lilacs or some scab on your fruit trees. Uh, maybe some early blight or uh, late blight on your tomato plants. Uh, if you've got some disease issues in your property and you're really not sure how to deal with them or where to start, this might be just the video for you. Let's go talk about plant disease. Today we're going to talk about plant disease and we're going to talk about the, the basic fundamentals of how diseases work and uh, the, the certain things that they need in order for them to actually have an effect on your landscape. Um, whether you, you're dealing with organic means or even if you're working with pesticides. Uh, in either situation, what we're going to talk about today is going to hold true across the board. Uh, and the same holds true with the kind of plants that we're dealing with. If you're dealing with uh, vegetable gardens or fruit trees or your ornamental plantings or even your front lawn. Uh, again, the things we're going to talk about today are going to hold true in all of those situations because we're just going to talk about the basic fundamentals of what diseases do and how they work. And if you understand those things, it puts you in a better position to try to effectively control disease even before you think about grabbing that spray bottle. I've uh, taken on my six-year-old daughter's uh, art easel because we're all about the fancy here at uh, Healthy Horticulture. And uh, I'm just going to point out real quickly what's called the disease triangle. I'm just going to put that up for just a minute because you can't talk about the fundamentals of disease without talking about the disease triangle. Uh, and, and, and then we're going to talk about each point of that in particular and things you can do to kind of alter those situations so that you can help to get control of diseases on your property. So here it is. So this is what is commonly referred to as the disease triangle. Uh, so if you ever hear people talking about the disease triangle or the fungus triangle, this is what they're talking about. And it's really quite simple. These are the three points that any disease needs in order to actually infect your plants. Okay, uh, It doesn't matter if you're talking about bacterial infections, fungal infections, and like I said before, it doesn't matter what kind of plant you're talking about. Um, across the board, you need these three points in order for a disease to actually infect your plants. And this is what they are. The first point is the host. You need the host plant. For example, if you don't have any apple trees, then you don't have to worry about apple scab. Pretty simple stuff. The second point is the pathogen. Okay, You actually have to have the pathogen somewhere in the environment in order to infect your trees. So if you don't have any apple scab fungus, but you have apple trees, you're not going to get an infection because you don't have the pathogen. The third one, which is really important and quite often overlooked, and we're going to talk about this today, is the environment. Uh, every fungus needs a particular environment in order for the pathogen to infect the host. It's usually some combination of rain or moisture and temperature. Um, and we're going to talk about that quite a bit because that's really important and, and a lot of times uh, people don't, don't pay enough attention to the environment when they're dealing with fungal problems. So that's it. That's basically the disease triangle uh, or the fungal triangle. So if you hear somebody talking about that, at least you're familiar with what, what they're actually talking about. Okay, now that we've gotten that out of the way, Let's, uh, let's talk about those three points on the triangle and some things that we can do to try to alter those, those points on the triangle and, and hopefully reduce the, uh, the amount of disease that we have on our properties. Uh, so we'll start with the first one, host. Uh, if you have apple trees on your property, then you have the host. And if you have scab, then your apple tree is a host for the scab or whatever. If, if you have lilacs and they have powdery mildew, whatever. You have the host, you have the pathogen. Uh, there's not a tremendous amount that you can do at that point if you have these plants already in place. But, if you're planning on adding fruit trees, uh, like I did here when we moved in here, I had two fruit trees and I added three more. Uh, or if you're planting a new orchard, or if you're planting a new garden or a new perennial bed, one thing that you can do is you can look for disease-resistant varieties. For example, if I was planting apples, 
uh, and, I, and I wanted specifically, you know, an apple tree that was resistant to scab, I'd be looking into varieties like Liberty or uh, even Honeycrisp. Honeycrisp is actually a, a pretty resistant variety of apple when it comes to scab. So depending on what you're planting, if you can uh, find disease resistant varieties and, and utilize those whenever you can, you are in essence removing the host. Uh, this can be especially helpful in vegetable gardening because in vegetable gardening, you know, typically you're replanting every year or sometimes twice a year. So if you are having a real problem with powdery mildew on your cucumbers, uh, you know, Google is your friend. Do, do a Google search and look for powdery mildew resistant cucumbers and you might find that there's varieties out there that are mildew resistant. Same with tomatoes, but things like blight and fusarium. I had a heck of a problem with fusarium uh, in my tomatoes last year. Um, so looking for disease resistant varieties and utilizing them can in essence eliminate the host. And remember, all you have to do is remove one point of that triangle and you can eliminate the disease. Uh, and another thing that is handy with the host is for disease diagnosis. If if you have, uh, let's say you get black spots on your leaves, if you know the host, it can, it can very much help to diagnose the disease. In other words, let's say you have black spots on your leaves and you go to Google and you search black spot on my leaf or on leaves, you're going to get a thousand results. You're going to get results for apple scab, you're going to get results for cirrusospora, you're going to get results for black spot on roses, you're going to get tar spot on maple, there's going to be a thousand results. If you know your host and you say black spot on apple leaves, well, that's going to narrow it right down to like scab and maybe rust, uh, maybe one other. And then you can use that to help diagnose your fungus so you know exactly what fungus you're dealing with. And that can come into play later, especially when we talk about the environmental aspect of this. Uh, so those are the two things uh, that are helpful with the host portion of the triangle. Now the next portion of the triangle is the pathogen. You have to have the pathogen present in order to have an infection. It kind of goes without saying. Um, and, and what can you do to alter that? Well, this is where sanitation can come in. Uh, if you know the fungus that you're dealing with and you can figure out its life cycle and how it overwinters, there are things that you can do through sanitation to help eliminate the pathogen from your property. Uh, for example, I, I'm talking a lot about apple trees because I work with apple trees a lot, but like I said earlier, this really holds true for any disease, any fungus out there, any plant problem, um, these factors come into play. But uh, for me, like for apple scab, you know, I know that if I go out in the springtime before the, before the weather warms up and, and the rain comes, and if I cut all the fields, uh, just by disturbing all the leaves on the ground, I can, I can disturb the, the spores on the leaves and you can reduce your scab by up to 30 or 40 percent. Um, uh, sterilizing your pruners is another big one. If you're dealing with systemic infections like fire blight or verticillium, uh, pseudomonas on lilacs, uh, any kind of an interior systemic bacterial infection, uh, you know, sterilizing your pruners can, can go a long way in keeping from spreading the disease. Again, you're eliminating the pathogen. Pruning, pruning out the, the diseased limbs so that you can eliminate the pathogen from your property. So by doing that, you can, you can, again, take a chunk out of one corner of that triangle. And every little bit helps in reducing disease overall. And then the third one I want to talk about is environment. And that's a big one. That's one that, that a lot of times gets overlooked. Um, and it's probably the most important one of all. In order for a pathogen to infect a host, it has to have the proper environmental conditions. And it is almost always some combination of moisture and temperature. Now that could mean rain. Usually it does mean rain. It could also mean humidity. For things like powdery mildew, a lot of times it's humidity and temperature, just as much as it is rain and temperature. Okay, uh, for scab, you need temperatures between, you know, 65 and 75, something like that, and a good amount of rain. You need a couple hours of rain. Uh, sometimes it can work on a sliding scale. Cedar apple rust, I know they've documented it quite accurately where they know that it, at 60 degrees you need three hours of rain. At 65 degrees you need two hours of rain. At 70 degrees you need one hour of rain. Um, and a little bit of research can, can really help to pinpoint 
the environmental conditions that any particular fungus needs in order to infect the host. So how can we adjust the environment? I mean, obviously, we can't control the weather. It's, it's going to rain when it's going to rain. Uh, but there are things that you can do to, again, to alter the environment around your trees. Pruning is a huge one. Uh, if you prune your trees in a fashion so that you have a, a nice open canopy, so that you have good air circulation and good sunlight penetrating through, remember, like I said, sometimes it takes, you know, three hours of rain and 60 degrees. Well, if it's 60 degrees and you only get one hour of rain, if you have a nice open canopy and the air can penetrate through there and the wind can blow through and the sun can beat down on it, those leaves and those stems might dry off fast enough that they don't have the three hours of moisture that they need in order for the disease to spread. And, and every time you can eliminate an event like that, you can eliminate a potential infection. Um, Another part where the environmental issues come into play, and I'm going to talk a lot about this in my next video. This is actually going to be a two-part video series. Is and, and a lot of people, I think, uh, maybe don't understand this or, or don't, don't give it enough, enough emphasis. 99.9% .9 of all fungicides out there, I don't care if you're dealing with organics or even if you're dealing with traditional chemical fungicides, even the restricted-use fungicides, 99.9% .9 of them are preventative, okay? Very few fungicides actually work on a curative level. If you have the infection in your plant, fungicides are not going to cure it. And this is where the environmental part comes in and it's so incredibly important. If you understand that you're gonna have a fungus problem, if you have apples and you know this scab is gonna be an issue, you wanna be watching the environment. Because as soon as spring rolls around and they start to push out their little leaves and it starts to get warm and they say, oh, next Tuesday it's going to rain. Well, even if you're working with organics, either way, you want to get your fungicide out a day before it rains so that you can get the full effects of that preventative fungicide. And by doing that, you're going to get much, much better control than if you wait until you see the fungus on your leaves and then you spray. Because by then, your trees are already fully infected. And, and like I said, they don't, these things don't work on a curative level. They work on a preventative level a hundred times more effectively than they do on a curative level. A lot of times, if you, if you plan ahead and if you're aware of the fungal problems that you think you're going to run into, with just one or two well-timed sprays in a preventative manner, you could potentially eliminate having to do five or six or seven sprays down the road when you're trying to play catch up and you're trying to deal with it on a curative level. So the bottom line is, if you're dealing with fungal problems in your property or in your orchard or in your vegetable gardens, um, the first step is to really properly diagnose the problem that you're having. And then the second step is to think about that disease triangle and think about what you might be able to do to try to knock off one corner of that disease triangle. Uh, and, and the third step is, you know, research. Get to know your enemy. If you're dealing with a fungus, research it. If you have scab on your apple trees, look it up online and try to learn everything that you can about it so that you can deal with it effectively. Uh, a lot of times, you know, like I said, timing is, is imperative, but I can't give you necessarily specific dates. Like I'm, I'm usually spraying for scab here in Connecticut maybe the third week of April, fourth week of April, something like that, but it kind of depends on how spring comes in. Now, if you live in Florida, you might be dealing with a completely different time frame, okay? In Texas, you're gonna be dealing with a completely different time frame. So if you wanna look up some of these fungus, or some of these disease problems and learn about them so that you can deal with them preventatively and effectively, what I always recommend is try to find like university websites that are local to where you live. Like if you live in Texas, you know, look for things like Texas A&M and they will have on their website all kinds of, you know, IPM, integrated pest management things. And they'll talk about dealing with scab or rust or powdery mildew or whatever uh, in that environment, in your environment. You know, if you live in Ohio, go to Ohio University. They've got a tremendous website. Here in Connecticut, I use Yukon. Yukon has a great IPM website that can give me a lot of information regarding timing and control of different things. Uh, and and if, you, if you put those fundamentals together and understand the host, the pathogen, and the environment, 
and understand that if you are utilizing spray applications, whether it's chemical or organic, they work preventatively tenfold better than they're going to work curatively. And the only way you can use them preventatively and accurately is if you understand the environment, that third corner of the triangle, know your fungus, know when it's going to move so that you can be ready for it, get your spray out there a day or two before that rain event comes, that moisture event comes, or those humidity levels come. Try to get that spray out there a day or two beforehand so that you've got your preventative control in place before the pathogen tries to move on to the host. And if you do that, you'll find you're going to spend a lot less money on pesticides, a lot less time trying to spray your plants, and a lot less aggravation because the sprays are actually going to work. In my next video, I'm actually going to talk about individual fungicides, uh, mostly the organic end of things. Uh, I always lean to the organic end of things, but, but I'm not against chemical pesticides. I, I have my restricted use license. I, I use pesticides when I have to, but I always try to uh, utilize organic means first whenever I can. And in my next video, uh, the part two of this one, we're going to talk about individual fungicides and exactly how they work. Things like insecticidal soap, neem oil. We're going to talk about biological fungicides, some of these beneficial bacteria like uh, Bt and, and bacillus and milky spore and, and all kinds of different things like that. And some of the little tips and tricks that I use when I'm using those products to really make sure that when I do use them, they're effective. I hope this video helped and uh, keep an eye out for that next video. Hopefully it'll be out in about a week or so. Thanks.